and welcome to episode 101. 101. The Carrier's Edge podcast. I'm Mark Morell, co founder of Carrier's Edge, joined by Jane Jazrawi, the other co founder of Carrier's Edge. Hello, Mark. Hello, Jane. And we are right in the middle of the uh, hurricane Insanity. right now. Yes. As of uh, this moment, it is one week until our big Best Fleets event. Jane and I are both trying to find time to actually build the content for our portions of it. We are both sick. <laughs> I think and, I may not be as sick as tired. Yeah. So Well, tired and sick always go together. Yeah, but I don't I don't think I don't feel like I have any symptoms anymore except just feeling like crap. Your brain is just foggy as you yeah. try and parse yeah. the numbers together. You, on the other hand, have your I am starting to customary. come out the other end of it and feel a bit better, but I sound awful, so yes. I expect there's going to be a lot of editing necessary here to remove hacks and coughs <laughs> and with any luck, no sle- no sneezes at least. Oh, please, no sneezes. Oh, my Lord. Your sneezes are like huge amounts of decibels. <laughs> yes. I will not deafen people with those. So, well... It seems like we're probably going to talk about content for our event because that's mostly what we have been buried in. That is what we have been doing for the last little while. I would say the last month or so has been getting more and more best fleets, blessed fleets, and it's it's like a fever pitch now. Yeah. And it's been more and more urgent to try and actually get the time to put the content Mm -hmm. together. For our last episode, I talked about our session at Mid-America that we were about to do. And how did that go? I... I think it went well, which is a phrase rarely uttered by me. <laughs> Usually when people ask me how it went, I have a litany of gripes of all the little things I wish I'd done differently. But at that point, I thought, you know what? I was actually pretty happy with how it went. It wasn't a big audience. That was my big question mark going into it is who comes to this, these things? Who comes to these education sessions at a truck show? How many people are coming and what is their makeup? I didn't know if it was going to be all drivers, all fleet people, if it was just going to be vendors looking for a seat. Who knows? Well, it was all of the above. (laughs) We had built our slides kind of intentionally vague uh, with some broad statements on them with the thinking that we would pull the audience at the beginning and then tailor the content to fit the audience. Except that on that stage, there's bright lights in your eye and you can't really see when you ask people or show of hands who does this and who does that. You can't necessarily see all of them. So Yeah, you have to get off the stage and go peer at them and then go back on. So Yeah, so from what I could tell, it was a pretty even split of owner-operator, company driver, um, carrier people, and vendors. So that uh, kind of checked every box. So we just kind of did a generic version of the content, but it was good. I find it fascinating to do a session like that and have so many people come up afterwards and make it clear that they'd never heard of the program before this. And I'm like, how is that possible? This thing has been going on for 16 years now. We are in the media all the time. We had a four-part story in the, in the media in heavy-duty tra- trucking last week going through the results of the Best Fleets program. How are there people that still haven't heard of it? I think that people, unlike us, because the way that we consume the news is we look at everything that everybody sends. So we look at ATA, um, heavy-duty trucking, we look at CCJ, we look at the Canadian news, we look at, you know, we might look at the um, owner-operator landline magazine as well. So we're, we're kind of everywhere. We're consuming a lot of different places where the news comes from. But I can see that some people have one source of news that they use. So they are only getting their trucking news from ATA, or they're only getting it from their state association, or they only they're only going to um, not maybe not even truck news, maybe they're looking at um, a smaller magazine that like a recruiting magazine, you know, maybe they don't read news at all and really assume that you know, if you're not at the show that I go to, then you don't exist. Mm. So I think that's kind of like, we try really hard to sort of spread ourselves out around everybody, but there are still like tons of people who have never heard of Carrier's Edge, never heard of Best Ways to Drive For. And 
I feel like we've saturated a whole bunch yeah. of stuff like that. Even if you don't want to be a customer or participate, you still know who we are. But it's a huge industry and there's so many different little bitless sectors and bits. And, you know, some people are only they're only dealing with um, fuel hauling and they don't really want to deal with anything else. So they're only agriculture and they don't want to hear about you know, LTL or over yeah. the road and that kind of well, thing. Well, that's that's a very good observation because I see people say, oh, it's a small industry. It's a big industry, but it's a small industry because you see the same people over and over. Mm. And what I've realized, it's actually a lot of small industries. Yeah. And yes, there are little pockets where you see the same people and there's a lot of overlap, but those pockets are completely disconnected from other pockets. So private fleets are completely disconnected from a lot of the for hire people. Tanker people are in their own world doing their own things and like livestock haulers are doing their own things. And all of the owner operators that living, they're living in the spot market, same kind of thing. So there's a lot of these little pockets of small world kind of things. And once you're in one of them, you see a lot of the same thing over and over. But I guess that's it. There's a lot of these small pockets that we haven't got to yet, but it's. I mean, unless we are at every single show that exists on the planet will probably still miss people. And it might be that they haven't gone to a show for a few years and or they haven't done anything. And they're just, you know, kind of doing their own thing, like just trying to get their freight and move their freight and collect their fees and whatever. Kind of like, I think for us in the e-learning world, like sometimes we just have not paid attention to yeah. it. Well, that's true. That's true. And, you know something will kind of come out of left field and take us by surprise. And it's because we're not following the industry that we are from Yeah, because we're following the industry that we serve. Yeah. Okay. That's a good observation. Good point. Yeah. Well, it always strikes me because anytime I do a presentation about best fleet stuff, I start at the beginning by talking about the program itself and how it works and why we do it the way we do and I've done it so many times that I always think, oh, do we really need to do this? Like, doesn't everybody know all this stuff? We're even going through it prepping for our event next week. Do we really need to go through all of this stuff? And yep, we need to go through it because there's people for whom it's new. Well, we're going to have to go through it because the press may not have heard it. Right. And we're getting, I think, uh, the press, most of the press that are coming to our event are people who may not know because the ones who are more experienced are all going to take off to Sweden, is it? Yes. Yeah, they get yes. a nice trip to Sweden. So, so. thanks, Volvo, <laughs> for that. <laughs> yes, we booked our event and booked media to come, and then uh, they started kind of sheepishly saying, well, you know, I'm not actually going to be able to make it to your event because Volvo's doing something in Sweden, and how could I pass up a trip to Sweden? So we're going to send a, a different editor. We've got a new editor, and it's going to be a good way for them to learn. So we're getting some of these editors that are newer to the uh, newer to the beat. So, yeah, we will have to cover that. Well, we also that happens a lot to us, and that, it, that whole we end up teaching people, yeah, about the industry or about their, or you know, sometimes we have a customer who has a new admin, and mm-hmm. then we end up teaching them how everything works at their carrier. Yep. <laughs> And we did that when we did custom work, too. Oh, yeah. You always end up educating your customers on how their own businesses work. Yeah. And it is a bit, it is a bit of a pain, but it's, I know that it's very much appreciated by the people who, Mm -hmm. who need that knowledge because they may not be able to get it from their own company. So, you know, get it where you need to get it. Yeah. Well, one of the other things that came up at Matt's that I was really happy about. The thing that I really enjoy about going to truck shows more so than conferences is actually getting a chance to talk to the drivers that work at our customer companies because I can't always talk to them. I don't do frontline support anymore. And even when you're doing frontline support, they're calling in when they have a problem. So it's a different kind of situation. They're often trying to get something done. So you just need to help them. You can't be picking their brain for an hour about life on the road or anything, but when they come by our booth at a show, well, that's fair game. So if it's a driver working for one of our our customer fleets, they often will come by just to say, hey, we use you and have some questions about it. Sometimes they have a bit of a gripe or something and 
often it's just how the program is being administered. So I can talk to them about that and take away notes that we can follow up with their, um, their safety people about, but it's always great to talk to them about how they're using it, what they think of it, what they'd like to see more of, get that kind of direct feedback. And I, I always love seeing when they pull out a phone and bring up our app and there's some content and their assignments on there that they're working through or they have questions about it. So it's very cool. So I got to talk to not as many this time as I have in past years, but maybe five or six. Well, wasn't fleets. the total um, attendance for Matt's kind of down? Definitely down. Yes. They were advertising something like 55,000 people, which is fairly low for Matt's. For other shows, that would be huge. But for Matt's, that's that's starting to shrink. And the uh, vendor count was definitely down. The exhibitors, uh, there's a bunch of, there's always some who don't show. You, you can tell that they booked a booth and then didn't show. But there's more of those than normal. There was a good number of spaces that clearly didn't sell because there's not even a booth there. They just put a, a pathway or they put a bench there or something uh, where there would normally be a booth. Yeah, where it makes sense to have a booth. You know, there's a bench where it doesn't make any sense for there to be a bench. So you can tell that there's somebody who, who or they either didn't sell the space or somebody pulled out, uh, you know, at the last minute. So there's a bunch of that, but that's to be expected in a down economy and lots of people that were griping about the economy. And some of the education sessions dealing with brokers and load boards uh, did get uh, a bit heated from what I understand uh, because there are people that are unhappy about what's happening with the spot market and what's happening with rates and how much brokers are still making off of those loads. And the transparency that yeah. uh, of what people are getting and what the load board is getting, that was, yeah. I, I think that is what makes people really mad if they're not getting the whole story and they feel like they're being fooled, that's going to cause a lot of anger. Yeah. Yeah. Which brings us very nicely into one of the things that I know you're working on right now, which is digging through the driver surveys. Oh, yes. To put together your content for your general session uh, next week. Because that's what I do. I dig through the surveys and it's one of the most difficult things to do because I find the most interesting thing is what drivers say that isn't the answer to a direct question. It's, well, it is kind of the answer to a direct question, but it's, um, we have two questions at the end, which is what do you like the best at your company and what, basically, what do you like the least or what do you think should be improved? And I've been looking at these, these answers for a lot of different, you know, multiple years and I did a I, I did a seminar series with Great West Casualty in 2018, and I did I did a presentation that had the same. I was looking at the same information, and the difference between 2018 and 2024 is, or 2023, let's say, um, is quite interesting because um, things have definitely changed in the industry, hmm. and I. Um, I have to, when you look at the, what do you like the best and what do you like the least, you have to look, I mean, there isn't any direct answers. You have to look to, at the comments. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the comments, what are you looking for? Yeah. I mean, you how see, do you. Are there any trends? Is there common answers? Yeah. And what you look for is how many times do people say the same word over or and over again? Words, certain combinations yeah. of words that mean the same thing. Yeah, and you can and and the way that I used to try and figure this out is by doing a word cloud mm -hmm. because when you use online word clouds it'll pull out the most common words and you can go and edit it and and get rid of like the you don't want the yeah. is going to be very common. But now there are more um you can find these tools that will basically, you know, suck out all the text and do that analysis a little bit for you. Um and what I found, well, I don't know if I should tell you what I found. No. Well, you can tease it. I can tease it? Yes. It is. So what I would say is that in general, people like the fleets that they're working for better. Um, but they're very unhappy about specific things. Mm -hmm. So the satisfaction with certain things has gotten lower but the overall satisfaction has gotten higher. So overall, they like their companies, but they have some very defined gripes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And those gripes are not getting better. Interesting. It's, it, they, I, well, they, the gripes are, 
So when I look back at the last couple of years, it's pretty much the same. The numbers are not that different. But when you look five years ago, they're very yeah. different. So that's what I find interesting about what you're doing. It's easy to look at a set of numbers that come in for a year and say, this thing is more popular than this thing, or people like this and don't like that. And within the context of that specific block of data, that might be somewhat useful. And that's what a lot of people do is they look at that. And that's the obvious starting point is to see where the most common things, where's the popular stuff, the unpopular stuff. But what you started doing here is looking back uh, over years, because now we've got such a mountain of past year information to compare to that you started to look back and compare it to previous years. And what I thought was interesting is you started, I think, going back five years or something. You went back to like 2019, which is a really interesting time because since then, there's been such a a whipsaw effect of COVID and then post-COVID crazy and then post-post-COVID depression and everything sucks and where are we at now? So we still aren't really back or not really reset to where we were at pre-COVID it's kind of whipping around wildly from one side to another, sort of the pendulum swinging wildly and it hasn't really established a, a balance point yet. Well, there's different things pulling now. Hmm. Um, and I would say that retirements are starting to become an issue. I find that so fascinating. Well, it's not, it's not the fact that people are leaving the industry. It's, that people are more interested in retirement savings now. And when we were doing the best fleets, like in the 20 teens, Mm -hmm. no one cared. No, but what's fascinating about that is you're also finding that the age is starting to skew lower. Yeah. So, well, there, but it's, it's not that that skewing lower. um, And I need to do a little bit more digging, but I think with contractors, it actually is the older, the oldest, generate like the oldest category of age, which would be 60 and above. I, there were very few, like that was the smallest. And I think, I think we had no, no contractors 60 and above in our, this year. Huh? Yeah. So, or it was like very few, little or none. So I want to see, what the trend was going back a couple of years to see if it is, you know, if it's an anomaly or if it's has been trending Mm -hmm. like that, because the, and for company drivers, it's still kind of the same, but for contractors, it's definitely not. It's different. It's very different. And because when I was looking at it, I was like, oh yeah, I got to get the contractors in there. And I thought it was going to be pretty much the same and it wasn't. So. I don't want it to go into any more detail than that because then what's the point of going yeah. to the event? Well, there's a whole <laughs> lot of other stuff and you got a lot of detail. Yeah, that's just that's just like the one slide I'm working on right now. Okay. But there's other um there's other interesting things. I don't know if it would be surprising, but it would probably be comforting for people to know that it's across the industry, it's not just you. Interesting, yeah. yeah. That's very different. And what are you working on when you're doing your stuff? At this point, I'm going to be doing a little bit of administrative work because we've got two guest speakers Mm. that have sent me their decks. So I've got to work their deck into our master template. And um, that's a little bit of administrative work. Uh, I did have a look through. Chris Henry from KSMTA has sent us his deck on traits of profitable companies And he's got a very interesting thing that he's doing as kind of a fun opening. He's doing a worst companies to drive for, worst fleets to drive for. Is it really? uh, Yeah, event. He's got a few slides talking about the the traits of the worst companies to drive for. So he doesn't name any companies. No, no. These these are the things that will set you up for failure. So I looked through the slides. He said, "Hey, this is my attempt at humor to do some of this in there." And I think it's going to be fantastic. It's going to be really fun. Oh, good. Or it may be a dismal failure, which in either case, it'll be fun to watch. Oh, that's (laughs) That's kind of mean for Chris. That's kind of cruel. (laughs) No, I'm sure it'll be good. Chris is a good speaker. He's got lots of great information. Mm -hmm. And I think it is kind of a fun way to spin it and talk about the things that they see that cause problems down the road. 
And he has some things that are pretty obvious. And I think it's something about trying to make your lease purchase program into a profit center or uh. like creative settlements, finding new ways to deduct from driver pay and stuff like that. Like, yeah, that's stuff that's just going to irritate the crap out of drivers. And of course, they're not going to be happy about it. And it doesn't end up saving the company any real money. As we know, as we have seen in the, over the last little while, it's been a lot of different ways to try and make money or try and move money around in such a way that less of it gets to drivers or yeah. more of it goes into the owner's pro- pocket. But Fudge the numbers, basically. Yeah. Yeah, it's an updated version of cooking the books. You don't really a better business, but you can make it look that way. What's really sad is that what ends up happening is that drivers paint every carrier the same way with the same, with, with that brush. Yeah. And they just assume that every carrier is trying to take advantage of, of them by, you know, cheating them in a lease purchase program or, or trying to, you know, fudge their miles so that they don't have to pay them as much. And it's really unfortunate because it's not, it is not, I don't even know if it's the majority of character carriers, but there's a certainly a very solid group of carriers who want to actually treat drivers well. And that's what we... That's crazy talk. I know, I know. But that's what we found over the last 15 years of the best fleets is that people are trying really hard. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I think Chris has got some good points on there. I think... Uh, I think it will align very nicely with some of the stuff that we're talking about. And, you know, you talking about uh, people trying to squeeze drivers in different ways. And that actually fits in with one of the things that I'm going to talk about in my opening session is things that end up getting dumped down onto the driver that really shouldn't be the driver's problem. You know, if you manage properly, you can pay drivers for these things. And then you solve the problem higher up the, uh, higher up the chain there and then it's not stuck on the driver and they're happier and your business is more efficient over the long run. Yeah. Andrew Boyle, Boyle Transportation used to have a, used to have a saying about that is basically take it off the backs of the drivers Mm -hmm. and, you know, manage it yourself. Yeah. And it's a little bit harder to do, but you're going to make your drivers a lot happier. I can't remember what exactly he said, but I remember him talking about it. Yeah. Well, I'm also tying it into the fact that it's better for the business overall. If you're dumping the stuff down onto a driver that really shouldn't be a driver problem, that's a business inefficiency Mm -hmm. that will bog you down over time. And the sooner you can identify and fix these inefficiencies, the faster you can improve your profitability. The one thing that I am seeing a trend, and I probably have talked about this before, is this... um, using AI as a replacement for a human being with a driver. So having AI answer a driver, like kind of like an Alexa for drivers. Oh boy. Yeah. I've seen it and I've seen, I've seen a couple of stories about it where people are thinking, Hey, you know, I don't have to, I don't have to answer the phone if a driver is calling anymore. If they have a common question, then, you know, someone, you know, AI can answer it. And I find that such a dangerous way to go. People do not like talking to computers. Oh, yeah. People have been screaming at their automated uh, call uh, director things for years. I know. Those cues that are like everybody's having to shout what it is that they want, and they're just saying, agent, agent, agent. English. Yeah, operator, please. (laughs) I know. know, Because it always wants you to speak something, and then it badly tries to interpret what you said. Or it just tells it, you it doesn't understand yeah. and sends you back to nothing. And tries to be friendly about it at the same time. Oh, it's a very pleasant voice that's not helping you at all. Yeah. But so it's very, nobody very Nobody wants annoying. more of that. And it also is a great example of solving the wrong problem. Mm-hmm. My whole first session is the wrong problem, the things that drivers say they want and fleets focus on that aren't necessarily the right things. So in that case... If you're getting the same questions over and over again, don't put an auto attendant on it. Don't put a chat bot to answer it. Figure out why nobody understands it. Communicate properly. Exactly. Uh. I know. I know. And it's not, you know, when you when you look at the, you know, what drivers like the best, hmm. it's not an automated attendant. 
That doesn't come up. Yeah, this company uses AI for all their communication. Yeah. That never came up. Thank goodness. So like, this where, is finally, I finally found the answer. Where does that fit into the, we treat everybody like family and you're a name, not a number? You're an insert name here instead of a number. Yeah, you're an interaction with our chatbot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, that whole chatbot thing, I don't like chatbots. They never, my questions are never answerable by a chatbot. Yeah. And sometimes it's not answerable by AI either. I've had many questions to chat GPT come back with either they're not allowed to answer it or they're not, you know, or they They don't just, have that information. They, yeah, they don't have or the they information. they suggest you go some obvious place that you went well before going there. I've never heard. Of, I remember uh, one of the, I had, a, I went to chat GPT to do some experimenting and I was doing it right before a show with Dave Nemo. Um, and I said, who is Dave Nemo? Okay. They had not heard of, AI had not heard of Dave Nemo (laughs) at all. They needed more information. So I had to basically do the Google search for them or basically tell them he's a D, you know, and then they kind of had some information. And then they read the about paragraph from the website, right? Exactly. Exactly. So I don't know. I don't, I, I, I think that AI is probably very helpful in some instances, but I don't think that trying to replace humans with AI is going to work in the long run. I think people are going to try it and realize that even if their drivers are happy with it to begin with, they're not going to be in in the long term. They want people to talk to. They want a human being who understands their issue and who can make them feel safe. Well, that was one of the things that I noticed at Matt's this year is less of that AI powered everything and all of these tech bros that are going to solve every problem in trucking. Mm. There's uh, a notable um, decline in their vendor presence and the amount of them walking around. So that definitely changed what took the their good. place. Weirdly, it was factoring companies. We had to have six or eight factoring companies come by our booth wanting to see if there's some way to work together. And How would we work with a factoring company? I don't know. So for anybody who's not familiar, a factoring company basically buys your receivables. So It's a collection agency, right? Yes. uh, A factoring company is like a collection agency. They go out and get the money from your customer uh, at 90 days or 120 days or whatever, but they pay you now. So you get the money soon, they uh, do the waiting and they take a piece of it. And there's tons of them out there now. I don't know why. Oh, I know why. Because people are Everybody wants their cash now. Well, people aren't paying for their services or their... Yeah, you know what? That's exactly right. Everybody is sitting on their cash. So the terms have gone from 60 to 90 days and 90 Mm -hmm. to 120. And they're, uh, they're taking their time paying their bills and small owner operators can't wait. Uh, they they can't sit and wait three months or four no. months. No, I remember when we were the equivalent of a small owner operator, and we wanted like getting net sixty was not a very happy time. Yes, net sixty was not a great time. Well, then there was I remember in the oh eight oh nine recession, it was sixty or ninety days. But then we only do a check run twice a month, so it'll be on the next run after sixty or after 90 days or whatever. So it could end up being a lot longer. Oh, and then we're going to put it in snail mail for you. Yeah. That's our policy. They are doing everything they can. The only thing that I haven't seen yet that used to happen periodically then is the check arrive, uh, arrived with no signature on it. That was a a great trick when they did that happen a lot. Uh, It used to happen periodically. That's a, a trick with smaller organizations that have manual signatures is they then they can say they've paid, they can put the check in the mail, and yeah, it's on its way, and then you get there and you can't cash it because there's no signature on it. Yeah, and, and then no you have to call, anything. and then you yep. have to do it again. Oh, okay, yeah. we'll get it at the next uh, next pay run. Yeah. So factoring companies solve those problems. They deal with all of that crap, and so you don't have to. So I could see them being much more popular with owner-operators now, for sure. So yeah, very interesting seeing the shifts and the decline of the AI powered everything at uh, at Matt's and very interesting what you're seeing in your research so far for drivers, what drivers like and what they don't like. 
Any other tidbits that have jumped out for you thus far? Not really that I can go into. Mm. Um, I'm going to be investigating some more things, but I haven't. I have. I know that what I want to look into. So wh- what I generally like to do is compare the driver surveys, what the, the sentiment is to what the carriers are doing. Mm-hmm. So our carriers. So, for example, if. Um, if there are if people are interested in retirement programs and our carriers offering them. Right. And of the top 20, are they offering them? Is it the general rule? Is it, you know, something that is going on is so it, that kind of thing. That's kind of what I I'm doing right now mm. is, is doing that comparison because you're not going to get that. Even if you do get a report, you're not going to get the entire, Yeah. you're not going to get the entire picture. Well, that's also stuff that is perfectly suited for you because it's a mass of information that needs to be <laughs> sorted through and needs someone to make sense of it. And that is definitely where your strength is, to go through that and compare it to see where the trends are, what are the surprising things, what's unexpected, where is there a gap between what drivers are asking for and what fleets are doing. And that's really useful kind of macro information for that opening session. One of the things that I'm not going to talk about, but I have noticed, is that the number of women really not changed. Yeah, I find that interesting. I think that's, I'm not sure if that's because, no, I don't know why that is. Because definitely the number, people are trying to increase the number of women. Definitely there is, you know, a huge increase in the efforts to, you know, engage women in the idea of becoming a driver. But I'm, and I think that some fleets are really having success in it, but overall not kind of, eh. Yeah. It hasn't made it's much just, of a difference. It's kind of kicking. Like, I, and I've noticed that when they talk about in the States now in Canada, it's been around three, three and a half percent for ages yep. in the U S they're, I know that women in trucking a while ago was saying it was up to 10, but it never was. I don't believe that it ever was, no. but I think it's really around seven. Yeah. It's maybe seven and a half, seven to eight. And that is about how it is. Well, I think it's around, I have to look at the actual numbers, but for the driver surveys, it's around 10 hmm. and it has been around 10. So 10% of our driver surveys come from women drivers. Yeah. Okay. Which is more than the actual so number of women drivers. A disproportionate number of our surveys are being done by women. If there's only 7% women in the fleet, mm-hmm. then 7% of our surveys should be from women. But we're above that. We're 10%. always like that. It's always, I, my suspicion, and I can't really verify this one, one way or the other, but I think that if you are in a team, it's mostly the women if there's a husband and wife team, it's probably mm-hmm. going to be the woman part of the team who's going to do the survey. I think that's where it yeah. skews. I think the teams actually um, kind of change that a little bit. Or it might be that women are more likely to do the survey in well, general. Could be. But what I find interesting about this is that we assume that the results that we get the feedback that we get from drivers in general is kind of indicative of the industry, even though it's, um, it's a smaller sample. It's not a a huge sample. It's not the entire industry by any means, but we assume that it is a representative sampling of drivers across fleets and certainly across the industry. If we look at the type of fleets that participate, but these are also the better operators So the companies that participate in our program are the better operators in the industry because they are the ones that have their act together enough to get nominated, to be able to go through the process, to complete things in the time it needs to be completed. Get all their driver surveys done. Yeah, get their surveys done. They have a mechanism for getting driver feedback. So that pushes them into the higher portion of the... uh, of the chart there as far as the the quality of the operation uh, of the fleet. But... I would say because of that, they probably are likely to have a higher percentage of women working for them than other fleets do. Because if you're a woman looking for a fleet, 
Are you going to put up with those garbagey or fleets that, let's say, are less mature, haven't got their act together yet, are maybe more struggling, that are still emerging? Or are you going to go to one of the better operators, certainly the people that are recognized as better operators, and feel that you're in better hands there? I think with the the fact that our surveys are a little bit skewed, I think it's because we have some fleets that are very high in women hmm. that just are. They have been, uh, Boyle, for example, is 40%, 45% women. I haven't looked at it lately, but I'm sure they hover around 50% as it is. Um, Prime is also like 27% women. Hmm. And so there are some that skew higher and that might have the numbers a little weird. That's why I don't really pay attention to it anymore. The other, I I don't think, I I don't think that the, the women drivers in the, in the industry is increasing that much. Yeah. I don't think it's statistically significant. I think that it is more significant. The age, the age range is dropping. I think that is definitely younger significant. Yeah. And you might have more women in a younger driver set, but it's mm. not, I don't think it's really happening yet. Interesting. I do. There's a lot more talk about it, but I don't know if that's actually increasing the number of women. So you just raised an interesting point that maybe it's not there's more younger people coming in. Maybe it's just the older people are leaving. So there's less of in the less of them in the sample. So it looks younger. In comparison. Well, you have to have the younger people doing it. Yeah, the younger people are there. Maybe the same number of younger people that it always was, but fewer of the older people. No, because the numbers are similar to what we had pre-COVID. Okay. So the number of surveys are... absolute numbers. Yeah. Okay. So it's not like we only have 3,500 surveys done and, you know... A thousand of them were old people, so they they're not in there no, anymore. It's that we still have the same number of surveys, right? So it's just that, and it's funny because it's not you don't see the change from year to year. You have to go back, yeah, you have to and go back. And that's when five because years. it's such a gradual change, like everything is super gradual. I think we probably don't see like every so often we see something, usually because of regulations that happens you know, like tech, right? Tech happened in a couple of years, tech really changed. And for demographics, you can't look at like, that's not going to happen. You're going to see like little gradual bits of change. Yeah. And, but if you look back and that's why I'm looking back five or six years, because I want to see, I'm not going to ever see a jump from year to year. I'm going to see a gradual little tiny bit. What I was looking for is when did that jump happen? Like when, how far do I have to go back to actually see a significant change? Okay. And it was 2018 is okay. pretty much it. Interesting. Yeah. But 2018 and 2019 were interesting because 2019 was a crazy period. Everybody mm. was just like, 2018 was pretty good. 2019 was like, it was like the roaring 20s. Okay. And then 2020 hit right. and it was like, <laughs> Hmm. And then everything, everything kind of reset in a bad way and everything is kind of now turning back to normal. I will say that one of the biggest changes between 2018 and now is education. Education is, has gone, like, I, I want to look at the number of new entrant programs. Oh, okay. New entrant stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Because new entrants and well, you know. I, I've noticed that as well, just anecdotally looking at how we score it every year. And it was like completely skewed and weird through COVID. And then it was, oh my God, we need drivers. Let's get some new entrant programs. And then this past year, I think it sort of shifted because there's people that weren't really looking for new drivers. They were just trying to keep the course. So that changed things a bit, but it's been very topsy-turvy for the last few years. Oh, yeah. And we know that people are interested in how to create a driver trainer that's going to create the drivers that you want. Mm. And that has been a, I think that's been a bit of a kind of a theme. And, you know, we sponsor Education Station, which is a Radio Nemo show that um, I think it's once a month on last Friday of every month and or first Friday of every, it's, it's on Friday, it, once a month. 
And it's talking about, you know, how to create a driver, how to, you know, what is the best way to train a driver? What is, you know, a, a good, what does a good school look like? And I think that the carriers are looking at that as well. Like they're trying to figure out how do we create a program that's going to give us a repeatable success rate because they don't want to have people come into the program programs and immediately or not be part of the industry. They're yeah. not doing it be, to make money. They're doing it to make drivers because they mm-hmm. need drivers. So how do you make a repeatable, sustainable um method of creating a driver who is able to function on the road and wants to stay there. Mm. I think that's half the battle is how do these people actually, how do you make them want to stay? Mm. So I'm going to look at that as well. Fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that, uh, that will build nicely on one of the things that I'm going through in my opening session about solving the wrong, wrong problems and make sure that you look at the actual cause of things as I'm going to break out turnover. And I was just thinking about this because you're talking about new entrant programs and everybody always thinks that if you have a new entrant program, you're going to have higher Higher turnover turnover. and year after year, we find that's not the case. Well, it it can be the case, but it doesn't have to be the case. One does not equal the other. And that was the problem that we had before where people were saying, Oh, well, I got a new entrant program. I have higher turnover. And you have a new entry program, but if you have higher turnover, what are you doing in that program that is not addressing something? There's a gap. You have mm-hmm. a gap. And I think the people who have been successful with their new entry programs have figured out what that gap is. Well, what I find interesting is the numbers end up very similar every year. So I look at it when I'm doing the final calculation before we figure out the winners, I look at that and I want to control for it to see, is there a difference? You know, if it is the case that certain, uh, certain types of program skew the turnover numbers, then I want to control from that control for it in the final scoring. So what I do is I look at the average retention across all of the uh, fleets. Then I also break it out by their score in the new entrant question because we score that. So we're going to assess the quality or how robust their new entrant program is. And I will break out the uh, driver retention or turnover rates by those different categories to see what happens. And it turns out that actually the people that have no new entrant program end up having worse turnover. So I think this year it was scored, it was between zero and four were the different uh, point values. So if you didn't have any program, you got a zero. If you had a very basic program, you got a one and then went up to very elaborate at four. And the people who scored one definitely had better turnover than the people who had a zero who didn't have any program. But then there is a gap. The two and three, those scores end up being people that have higher turnover. And then the fours have great turnover. So if you have a moderate program or a very robust program, it actually improves your driver retention quite a bit. But those kind of mid-range twos and threes programs, it actually hurts your driver retention. Because your program isn't developed properly. Yes. Yeah. It's maybe churning more people. Uh, It isn't. I think it's not developing the instructors quite the same way. Uh, But Yeah, it may also be that the ones, the very basic programs, are kind of a newer new entrant program. So there's a bit of novelty and excitement over that. Or it's a small number. Small number sometimes. Because if you're doing one-on-one training with someone, then you're going to have a better experience than if if you have a more formal program that isn't really developed yet and is a little bit more haphazard. Yeah. Then that's why I think that the you know, your, your turnover is going to be better on that lower end. Mm -hmm. And we had the same results with, um, we're talking about time away from home. Oh yeah. Remember when we were looking at that and it was. We used to score that for a bit, or we would track it to see if it was going to make a difference. And for the last couple of years, it hasn't made any difference. Yeah. Cause fleets have figured out how to. Yeah. It's not meaningful. No, it's interesting. Like the more that the fleet's, try and figure out how to make something 
um, not palatable, but something um, more, uh, what do you call it when you make it more likable? Hmm. Um, can't think of the word. More palatable? Not more palatable, because that makes, and that's make it sound like the job is attractive. That's it. So when you try and make the job more attractive for a specific route or a specific set of days that you're out or Mm -hmm. some specific thing, and you put effort into that, then it's going to have, I think you're going to have um, a much better, bigger effect. Mm. You know, when you pay attention to different groups of drivers needs. So what I found before, like when we started this program and 10 years ago, people would just sort of say, oh, we can't, it doesn't work. You know, we have to, we have to do it this way. There aren't enough dedicated routes. We're not, we don't, we don't do this. We don't do that. But people are not saying that as much anymore. And they're saying, okay, how do we, how do we do this? Mm -hmm. Or how do we, okay, here's where our retention sucks. So, you know, how are we going to make it better for this group of people? And they're becoming more specific than not. People aren't going, ah, drivers, they're Mm -hmm. just, they're just this mass that are, they're all the same. They're looking at specific drivers, new drivers, younger drivers, um, older drivers are looking at these different segments and trying to figure out, you know, what's going to appeal to them. Mm. So I think that's the difference. And the industry has definitely matured. Yeah. I would say. I would say so. Yes. Well, we've got a lot of stuff to talk about. Mm-hmm. And so I think that will probably bring us near the end for today. Uh, Our next episode, though, will be after this. We will either be very relieved, very happy, or very heartbroken, or some combination. (laughs) But either way, it will be done, and we'll be able to talk about something else. Yes, we'll be able to talk about our overall awards. And we'll be able to talk about Truck World, which we are doing as well. We've got a very busy April ahead of us. I'm very much looking forward to Truck World since we're... We've been out here um, in Victoria. I mean, it's it's weird, you know. Yeah, Ontario's... you've only been to one event since then. No, since we moved, haven't you? Yeah, I think it, no, it was at the Fleet Safety Council, yeah, that and that's it. it. That so, was. I'm looking forward up to on it. Six months ago. Yes, so we'll have much more to talk about uh, then. Uh, but in the meantime, there's still time to register for the Best Fleets Conference, and we will be uh, excited to see everybody there. Best Fleets to dryfor.com slash event. Yes. Okay. Well, that's going to wrap us up. Have a good day. Bye.